Good morning, everybody. Uh, I know that you've had a fantastic presentation from our daughter, Sarah. And I'm going to carry on now with what makes young learners pick these days. I'm going to be asking you lots and lots of questions. So I do hope that you will answer them in the chat box. I'd like to thank Macmillan for inviting me. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here in this session. I'm sure that I will thank you even more at the end when you join in with everything. So what makes young learners tick these days? I don't know if you've heard that word before, but these are our questions for today. Are your students different after the pandemic? If so, how are they different? Just write some things in the chat box to tell me. How are they different? How, if they've changed, how have they changed? And what does tick mean? What does this word mean to you? What makes you tick? in a webinar like this. What do I have to do to make you tick? I hope I've planned some things in to make you tick. Let me see, they got wilder and don't want to, they don't want to work, they're demotivated, they're lazy, they seem to seek more safety. Mm. They became insecure. They became lazier. Everybody's saying the same thing. The shorter the activity, the better they feel. Their attention span grew shorter instead of longer. Okay, these are great points. Thank you very much indeed. Lack of study habit, internet addiction, distracted, unfocused, social media addiction, insensitive. That's a problem. They got attached to the cell phone. Yep, exactly. So they had far more opportunities to become distracted while they were at home. So this is something that we've got to take notice of and we've got to plan it into our lessons so that we can rectify or at least address some of these problems that everybody in the world is facing, not just you, everybody. So let's ask some more, oops, let's ask some more questions. What did I do? Okay. How do you create tick making situations then if you've got to get them to tick? Has anybody told me what the word tick means? Could you write it again if you already did? Because I think I missed it. What do you need to plan for? What theories can guide you? And how do you manage it all? because it's a lot to manage. Okay, let me see what we've got here in the chat box. Using creativity, growing and moving, motivated, yes. If they tick, they are motivated. If they tick, they are engaged. If they uh, become involved in what you're doing and they are curious about what you're doing, they are ticking. So let's get them to just because it's functioning. So we want to get them functioning as learners. So that's what we want to do for them. Okay. Remember, please, babies were born to learn. They were not born to be taught what you want them to learn. Let them play. Let them carry on playing. During those first three years of life, babies, toddlers, learn more than they're going to learn in the rest of their life. And how do they learn it? They learn it through play because they are naturally inquisitive. I'm not saying don't teach. Of course, we are all teachers. But we have to be teachers and learners. And we have to learn what makes our students tick. So don't forget, babies were born to learn. Let them carry on learning through primary and through secondary 
and as adults. We all need to play. If we don't play, we grow old. So let them play. Let us play at the same time. I have found in my 50 years of teaching, I feel strange saying that. I have found that I've been able to put two packages together and by combining these two packages, I have been able to make my student take whatever their age actually. And into the bargain, I have been able to make myself tick. So I've never suffered burnout. The one package is using the five senses, using particularly the three senses of touch, sight, and hearing. When I say touch, I don't mean just holding feeling things or holding other feeling things. I mean touching their heart, touching their emotion. So you move them on the outside, but you also move them on the inside. And that's why they can tick in your classroom, even if they can't tick in somebody else's classroom. So we're going to use D-N-K, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic senses. We could also use taste and smell if you can think of some good exercises to do on those things. You can use them in a more limited way, perhaps, I must admit. For example, when I'm doing story time, I have my perfume bottle and I spray nice smell in the classroom and the students know, wow, it's story time, we're going to have a story now. So it prompts them to respond in a positive way. I also put together with the five senses, the spice of education, the spice of ELT. And I'm going to show you now how I teach the spice to you teachers. I'm going to do it in a multi-sensory way. I'm going to use visual actions. I'm going to use sounds that you can hear yourself saying them and me saying them. And I'm going to use touch in the sense that I'm going to be moving and I hope I'm going to move you. Say in the chat box, yes, if you will join in with me. I need you to join in with me because I need you to feel what the students feel when you do this kind of ELT with them. So please write in the chat box if you're going to join in with me. I need you to stand up. Oh, I'm getting some yeses. I'm getting excited now. Oh, that's fantastic. Great. So push your chair back. Stand up. Breathe deeply. And take your pointing finger, your hard work pointing finger, and point right to the ceiling. Look at the nail on the end of your pointing finger. And I want you to do some air streaming. We are going to stream, air stream, the word vice. And I'm going to tell you what this acronym means to me. I made this up. It's mine. So it's my spice. And the letters mean what I want you to do in the classroom. So we're going to say... We're going to be snakes for a moment. Okay, ready and go. Right down to the floors. I hope you're all doing it with me. What do you think S stands for? Snake, student. Yes, sounds, senses. Stood. Smile. <laughs> Super. Snake again. Shining. Speak. Be present. Ah, we're getting close. Smart. Smell. Sounds. Feelings. <laughs> S in my spice stands for social development. 
when we are working with students, we cannot have them sitting in rows in, in doing individual work. We have to have them working in pairs, in groups, in circles, in any kind of social situation. So they learn how to be sociable. How can they learn social feeling? How can they learn social skills if we don't give them an opportunity? So we do social development. Every lesson, there shouldn't be one lesson that goes by when you're not doing social development. Okay, now we're going to airstream fur. We're going to do a nice plosive fur and we're going to airstream fur. Ready, steady, go. Look at your nail. Fur or what? What does P stand for? Physical movement. Excellent. Play. It could be play as well. In my spice, it stands for physical development. We need to teach our students English language, body language. We need to teach them to stand up with their chin held high, their shoulders down, and a good straight body so that they can breathe deeply and have the confidence to open their mouths when they speak. So we need to do lots of physical work with them. We also take into account the idea that the muscles have memory. And whenever we do anything through physical motion, the muscles remember it better. And so the vocabulary becomes stickable. We have muscle memory. Everybody will tell you that if you learn to drive a car and then you don't drive for a while, when you go back to it, your muscles remember what you've got to do. You don't think about it. You just do it. The muscles have memory. Motricity, it's to do with motricity. It's to do actually with trace hypothesis, but we won't be going into that. Okay, now we're going to do I. And we're going to say it. And we're going to do a nice big air screamed I in the air. And we're going to look at your nail. Don't forget to look. So that your eye is following the shape of the word. Ready, steady, go. It, 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 it for interaction, intelligence, interaction, imagination. Wow. Hearing, amazing, visual. It for in my spine, it's a for intellectual. Every, the other things are good as well. I'm not saying inspiration is wrong, but in mine, it's intellectual because intellectual covers all the thinking skills. Everything we do in our language classes must be underpinned by thinking and hopefully working at Bloom's Taxonomy Level 6, the top level in Bloom's Taxonomy. So for me, it's intellectual because that covers all the thinking skills, which lead me directly on to C. So the hops, exactly. Very well done. The hops, not the lot. Great. Great answers. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do a C and we're going to say, ready and go. We're using the back, we're using visual, we're using auditory, we're using kinesthetic, and everybody's saying creativity, but also collaboration, critical thinking. There's plenty of C's in our English language classrooms if we do it to make them tick. So creativity for me. And now we're going to do E. So get your hard work pointing finger ready, and we're going to say, E for oh yes emotions emotional growth okay E for energy 
and E for empathy. Wow, we're putting a lot of things into spice today. That's wonderful. For me, it means emotional development. How can our students possibly understand other people if they don't understand themselves? Where do my emotions come from? Why am I feeling like this today? Why do I get so angry when something doesn't work for me? So we have to work on their emotional development and then afterwards, they can work on other people's emotional development. Let's face it, we're all in this business because we want to have a better world. We want to have a better world for our students. We want to have a better world in the classroom for our young learners. We want them to want to come to school. We want them to get up every morning and say, oh, I'm going to school, I'm going to start English. And we want them to say, every day when the class finishes, oh, please, teacher, stay with me and teach me some more English. So this is what we're after. We're after the spice. I'm going to give you a test now. What does E stand for? Who can remember? Emotion, emotional growth, great, emotional development. S. S for social, brilliant, excellent. P for physical, great, great. You see how you learn when you use B-A-K. C for creativity, wow, that was quick. And I for, this is the hardest, intellectual, intellectual growth, wow. This is fantastic. I'm going to save the chat so that I can read it at leisure later. Fantastic. What a great group of people. Okay, so now you know. Five senses, multisensory education, coupled with the spice. In every class that you do, plan for it. Plan it in and make them tick. Look at these students. Are they ticking? Are they engaged? Are they loving what they're doing? Do they look happy? Are they joining in? Are they molding? Are they speaking? Get them to take by what you do. It's all to do with you. Yes, they are. Lots of yeses. Great. Fantastic. They are happy to get ticking. <laughs> exactly. That's wildly. Now, what I want you to do, which is something that I've been doing for 50 years, I won't let you forget, doing research. Open a notebook, open your journal, write in your journal every single day so that you are always observing, you are always watching, you are always looking. What makes your learners smile and laugh? What gets and keeps your learners' attention? What gets your learners excited? What are your learners' favorite things to do? What do your learners work hard at doing? Many of you said they were lazier now after the pandemic, but if we give them things that they enjoy doing and that they are interested in, they will work hard for us, I promise you. Do you believe me? I'm from Liverpool, so you better be careful. What brings out the best in your learners? What gets your learners to try new things that they know they can't do yet? And what do your learners choose to do most often? You know some of these already. Singing songs, dancing, they need to have determination, playing games, and all the other things that I'm going to show you now. I've got a few activities as Sarah had for you. There are two types of ways of looking at this. One is defining their personal interests one by one. And they can be many things, as you can see from the words there on my deck. I'm not going to read it for you. You can read. And then also 
situational interests. And these situational interests emerge at the time when there's something about the activity that grabs them, when there's some material that you're using with them that really attracts their attention, or a person, you, or a real person comes into the classroom, or somebody in the story, or somebody in the literature, or somebody in the comprehension exercise, maybe a hero, maybe a superhero, grabs their attention. So it's as Sarah said, when the situation is new, interesting, unexpected, contrastive, that's when you grab their attention and you get them ticking. It depends on how much hands-on learning you do. Many of my teachers have told me that the students always want to go for these things. These dreadful things. No, I love my phone. So does everybody. But they can be distracting in the classroom. How do we stop them from going to their phones? By doing things with them so they don't even reach out. So we have to have interaction with real people. Not interaction with the phone. Interaction with me. Interaction with other students in the classroom. Interaction with the text. I always tell my teachers, keep the text, enhance the task. So make the task a little bit different. Do something different. And lots and lots of advice in your Macmillan textbooks. Use realia. Use real things that they can hold, they can feel, they can show. Use images, sound, and video. Get them thinking, feeling, moving, responding, creating, and get hold of that involvement and that engagement. And as Sarah said, give them responsibility. Give them little jobs in the classroom. And above all, give them choice. Use choice boards so that they can choose to do the things they like doing and choose to do the things they like doing in the way they like doing them. So, realia helps a lot. I agree, Irma. It really does because it's part of their life. It's part of their real life. Okay. I'm going to do a visualization with you now. I think we should use visualizations more often. So I'd like you to close your eyes and just imagine that this box of chocolates is sitting there on your desk, on your table in front of you. I take my box of chocolates into the classroom with me, or we make a box of chocolates with clay, and we all contribute one chocolate box. So we're going to do V-A-K again, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. And I want you to stand up and will breathe deeply. And I want you to join in with me doing the actions to this little poem, this little chant. The bow fell for the chicken. Brewing. Brewing. The box born of chocolates. Mm. My prize today, triangles, circles, rectangles, and square. From the box, into my tummy. Chocolates, yummy, yummy, yummy. You can revive lots and lots of language and you can all enjoy that feeling of eating chocolate. I think almost everybody loves to receive a box of chocolate. So it's very positive. It's about taste. So we've got V-A-K and taste and we may have smell if we can ask them to. You're actually the smell of the chocolate. And you know how when you eat, 
you can smell what you're eating as well. So we've got all the senses in this one. You're going to get the slides so you can have that little poem uh, by the end of the week or by the end of next week, maybe. Okay. Doesn't want to go wrong. Would it go on? Oh. I don't know what's happening. Something strange has happened. I can't get out of this. My mouse has stuck. I have to tame the mouse. We usually talk about taming the lion. I have to tame my mouse. Okay, let's go on. There uh, we are. I do a lovely exercise, which almost every age group enjoys it, actually. I'd like you to just put into the chat box some animal names for me. Could you put some animal names into the chat box for me? Let me see. Lion, tiger, goat, dingo, dog, owl, snake, sheep, hamster, squirrel, panda, jacaranda, jacaranda, no, uh, elephant, guinea pig. Wow, we've got lots. So you can ask your students for lots of animal names. And then you can take in your realia. I really am a witch, so I happen to have a witch's. And as I am a witch, I've got my witch's wand. And I want you to join in with me. I touch my nose. I touch my ear and abracadabra, everybody, everybody is a lion. Yeah. Show me your lion. Let me hear the sound of your lion. Um, then you can go around taking photographs and put the photographs on your blog. What else could we do? We could do an elephant. We could do a tiger. We could do a, a hamster. With big cheeks like I've got already. You could do actions as well. Everybody is eating the giant hamburger. Everybody is jumping up and down. Everybody is. What else could they be doing? What ideas can you think of? Ah, uh, yes, you can't see my hat very well. That better if I go like that. <laughs> it's because I've got my back screen on. Okay, they could run, they could dance, they could jump up and down, they could be sleeping, they could be... <laughs> I know my hat is far missing. Maybe that means I'm only half a witch. <laughs> you can think of any actions, any ideas you want, and do this exercise. And then you give one of the students the responsibility. You give them the they you give them the hat, you give them the wand, and they go out to the front and they do the exercise themselves. They become the teacher. Always let your students become the teacher if you think they're up to it. It really helps a lot. Okay. And I had this idea many, many years ago. When we were thinking of proverbs and, and also thinking of phrases, famous phrases that we use all the time, and we don't really know what they mean or where they came from, it's, oops, sorry, it's called The Walls Have Ears. And in this exercise, you ask the students what it means. Does anybody here know what it means? Can you put it in the chat box, please? What does it mean, the walls have ears? Shh. Yes, it means mind what you say. Be very, very careful because somebody is listening to you. Everybody can hear what you're saying. Big brother is around. So the walls have ears. Let your students listen to the wall in the bus room. So you have all your class silently leaning against the wall and listening to the story that is coming out of the wall. 
I let my students go into the corridors, even into my office. I was a teaching headmistress and I let them go into the office and listen to the walls in my office to find out what's been going on in there. When teachers have sent me naughty students, students who are too distracted or students who are fighting or students who are saying nasty things to other students. So the walls in my office had lots of stories to tell. So give them a couple of minutes to listen to the walls and then have them come back and tell the class the stories that they heard. They will shock you. Their imaginations are so strong at that age that they will think of all sorts of things. And of course, you're using all the language that you have taught them. So you are really developing them. If you don't have enough walls in your classroom, or if you've got an extremely big class, you can just ask them to put their ear down on the desk. I've disappeared, haven't I? Here I am. And listen to the desk. Listen to the stories of the desk. And then as a writing, as a writing task, you could ask them to write those stories. It's a fabulous exercise. My students have loved it in the past. So now we're going to move on to our last activity for this moment of activity. And we're going to do an exercise called My Daddy is a Baker. So I want you all to stand up. Are you going to join in with me? Say yes in the chat box if you are. Stand up. Get your bowl and your big wooden spoon. And you're going to stir the batter. We're going to make pancake. So join in after I've sung the first line, please. I'll repeat it. Ready, go. My daddy is a baker. Join in. My daddy is a baker. My mommy is a dentist. Ah, 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 ah. My mommy is a dentist. Ah, 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 ah. My sister is a shadow. My sister is a shadow. Hunky punky, hunky punky. My brother is a cowboy. Turn around, touch the ground, and but again. Now, there was one school I was in that said, we can't have any banging going on around here. So I did turn around, touch the ground, and just to change it a little bit so everybody was happy. So from the top, ready? My daddy is a baker. Yummy, 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 yummy. My mommy is a dentist. Ah, 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 ah. My sister is a sheriff. Hunky punky, 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 punky. My brother is a cowboy. Turn around, touch the ground, and... <laughs> okay, so that's the end of the activities for today, but I do have a few reminders for you. If you want your students to tick, you need to remember that there are personal interests and there are situational interests. And I would like to know what new activity you can include after attending this webinar. What are you going to do when you go back to school? Just put it in the chat box. What are you going to take away with you? What are you going to include in your classes that you didn't have before? Tell me concretely. Almost everything. Wow. Great. Physical activities, the spice. Great. Situational interest. Wow. Mysterious thing. Contrast. Magic spells. All right. Very nice. Great. Thank you. So I want you to revise. Remember. Never ever forget that every day you talk to your students that they are kinesthetic. They are curious. They are playful. They're searching for love. They're searching for knowledge. They are endearing. 
They are growing. They are learning. They are discovering. And do all of these things with them. Don't just do the same old thing all the time. So keep your text. Enhance the task. And remember to include all of the things from multisensory education and the spy. So I'd like to say thank you in many, many languages to all the people who are here today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Even though I couldn't see if you were really joining in with me, I would have liked to see you. But if you can take away one or two ideas that will change life in the classroom. For thousands of students around the world, what a change we can make. Let's make a better world by offering our students a better English language class. Every day, every time. Thank you so much for all your comments in the chat box. You've been really participatory and I'm going to save it again so that I can read it afterwards. Lovely. Thank you very much, Macmillan. Thank you very much, all of you. And special thanks to Will Rickson, who all invited me in the first place. Thank you. Over to you, Marlene. Well, hello again. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It's been very inspirational and well everybody's thanking you we have just some questions if 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 you if you'd like to answer them yes a oh. few question uh one is from tatia she says that as the attitude of motivation varies according to students age could you please share what practical and useful strategies to use for teenagers ah yes so ideas maybe i knew that question would come up um, but I wasn't asked to do anything on teenagers today. But many of the, I think strategies are the way. I think strategies are the answer to most of our problems. Uh, if you had a, a question about ADHD. Strategies for ADHD students really help them, no matter what their age is. And in terms of teenagers, I've always found that we have to motivate them in different ways, but equally finding strategies which go with their interests. Mm -hmm. So I have about, uh, I would say about 200 strategies in my head. <laughs> and uh, I teach my teachers how to use those strategies with whatever age it is they're teaching. So we do some things for teenagers, some things for primary, some things for kindergarten, some things for adults because I've taught in all those ranges. And I think you just need to look it up, go on a course, find a conference, and you will find loads and loads of ways mm -hmm. to motivate anybody. Yes, 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 yes. I completely agree. I can't say this is do Eddie now because we have a Yes, yes, of course, of course, uh, we understand. Okay, and there is another question by Mikhail. He says, what do you think, how many students attend at lessons in one class? I think that it has to do with the number of the, the students. Uh, I wonder if we have got only one or two students in a class, how will be uh, teaching methods uh, implemented, I think, yes? And if you can share your experiences or ideas. Very, Maybe very for smaller classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I personally, and I'm admitting this with you, is that I personally have found smaller classes more difficult because you don't get the dynamics going in a larger class. I actually prefer 18 to 30 in a class. Mm -hmm. That I think is really manageable. Bigger than that is much harder, and I have taught classes bigger than that, but you can do it if your classroom manages. Yes. And then with private students, you have to become their peer in a way. Yes. Yes. You have to become another student, join in with them on everything you do. So imagine yes. you're doing pair work with them and you are their peer. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and so you yes, have to do action like that. 
at the moment I'm teaching a lot of private, uh, well, teachers actually, I teach methodology. Um, and I do that with them. I become the other person to interact with in the class. So I think exactly. so. You always strategies. All right. And one question by Shisela. She says, uh, how can how can we be more effective using the task-based approach in order to make our students stick in our classes? Sometimes we tend to stick to traditional ways of teaching that we forget to use other strategies. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's one that I have always addressed ever since I started teaching. I think that Uh, task-based learning is the way to go unless you're into CLIL because CLIL actually includes task in it. Mm -hmm. It's part of the CLIL methodology. And I recently started, well, recently seven years, I've been teaching EMI in China, uh, Chinese professors, and they don't really understand what a task is. They find it very, very difficult to understand the difference between a task and an exercise. So I think you've got to define that for yourself first of all. Task-based learning has to have a real world task at the end of it, engage the student. And I have found that it's completely different from doing fill in the blank, completely different from doing yes. true or false. Although I have strategies for doing true or false with the body. <laughs> um, Once you get into using strategies, you can never go back to the old way of teaching. The old way. It's, you, see, you see the dynamic. You see the... Yes, system. that there is a purpose. It's, it's the, the objective. There's a reason. And you can join. These days, you can join with us. Other students from around the world, you can do a Zoom <laughs> class. You can join with another teacher, and they can talk yes. about the culture. They can show the things that they bought when they were on their holidays and say, why I bought this, why this attracted my attention. So, yes, there are a million things you can do. Exactly, exactly. All right, we have a, we have a, a course for that, Gateway to the World for Teenagers, if you're interested. Yes, that deals with yes, Western yeah. virtual classroom exchange, which is great. Um, Well, okay. Thank you, Susan. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. It was a, ma a wonderful, marvelous webinar.